Let it just saturate us and soak into us. In Jesus' name, amen. Today is a focus, of course, on the cross. A day where we, if we can say the word celebrate his death, because we know without a death there is no resurrection. And if that was just it, there was a death, there would be nothing to celebrate. I mean, I suppose we could celebrate when a saint goes home. We call it a homegoing celebration. At a, well, typical, you know, we, some call it a funeral. But, um, but we don't have that here. What we have is we have the one who died and rose again so that the saints could have new life and that we could have that hope. Romans chapter 5, if you're taking notes or if you have your Bibles. Romans chapter 5, starting with verse 6, I'm going to go through 11. Listen to this. Just, I'm going to say it. I might have to repeat it. I want this to, to get to us today. Paul wrote this to the church in Rome. He said, for when we were still without strength. I don't know about you, but sometimes it can get weary. Physical strength, spiritual strength. It says, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That is good news right there for each one of us. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God <laughs> demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If that wasn't enough, it says, but much more then. Now, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Not we might be. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, he said much more before. He's going to say, but much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, Paul says it gets better or it gets gooder and gooder. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Yes, we can celebrate a Good Friday. The brutal execution of our Lord. Remember, he gave his life. And we say, how can that be good? It's good for us. You see, there were many men who were crucified. So the cross itself is not holy because many men died on a cross. But the difference with Jesus is his resurrection. And I will either further submit that there have been men who have been raised from the dead. But the difference is the cross. It's the cross and the resurrection. And those who have been raised from the dead have been raised by the power of God. And perhaps for us believers who have found Christ and have experienced the goodness and the faithfulness of God, we might be able to somehow have a peace in our spirit about it, have somewhat of a spiritual understanding about it. But Paul understood when he wrote to the Corinthians, he said, for this message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Not everybody gets it. It may be foolishness to those who are perishing, it says, but to us who have been saved, it is the power of God. Today we have so much to celebrate. Paul also, Paul also said this in Philippians 3.10, it's okay if I give you scripture today. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead. 
See, the message of the cross stands alone. It can't be added to. It doesn't need any hype. It doesn't need a creative sermon. We all understand if you've been saved, you've been saved through Christ because of his death and his resurrection. And we're going to have communion just a bit. This is just a very extended version of my communion message. We're going to end with communion today. So let's not give the cross a programmed response. How can we look at what happened on the cross and ask, what is our minimum requirement? How can we just, is it okay to just get by? Is it okay to just come to church once in a while and gather with his people and just pray when we need something? And what is our minimum requirement? How can we look at what God did for us in this miraculous, indescribable gift and say, what is our minimal requirement? I would have to say that it should drive us to a compulsion for extreme Christianity. Because if you take a cross away from this story of Jesus, it might, you might get a moderate devotion at best. But in the shadow of this cross on a Good Friday, it's got to be all in or nothing. Because he went all in for us. And can I tell you, there's nothing more that we have to give him other than our hearts. There's nothing more. We, we can't give him anything. We can't add anything to the cross. We can't. There's nothing we can add to it. Uh, the cross and good tithing practices. No. Good, the cross and a deeply devoted prayer life. No. It's, it's the cross. The cross alone. The cross happens to be a really big deal. Jesus is a really big deal for those who are saved. Because without Calvary, the wages of sin were death, and that's what we deserved. But let's make sure we believe in the correct Jesus. Because the Mormons believe in Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses believe in Jesus. The Muslims believe in Jesus. But do they believe in the Jesus of the Bible? But do they believe in the Jesus that died for their sins and he rose again? No, let's make sure that we believe in the right one. And we know that even the demons in heaven know that Jesus is real. They know the real Jesus. They, they know a, a God, a Father, who sent Jesus. James writes and tells us, you believe that there is one God, you do well. For even the demons believe and tremble. Because he alone is worthy. There were seven statements that Jesus made on the cross. And I want to just take a moment and kind of just go over those seven statements that Jesus said on the cross. And the first one is through this first statement we see that he is... Our intercessor. How many of you know Jesus prays for us? And forever makes intercession for us. But there on the cross while he was hanging, he cried out to his father. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In other words, is he really saying that because he was crucifying or did he know? And he already foretold he would, be, he would go to Jerusalem and he would be crucified. He had already told his disciples that he was, that was going to happen. And it, he would raise again on the third day. But he said, forgive them. Because their hearts weren't right. Even though he knew. It wasn't that they were not fulfilling scripture. They were actually fulfilling prophecy. But not just forgive those Roman soldiers, but forgive his betrayer. Forgive the priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees who had condemned him. The one that I'm sure they taught about from the prophets of old through their writings and 
Torah of the coming Messiah. And here he was before them, and they condemned him to death and turned him over to Rome. And forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. He's our intercessor. The second statement that Jesus makes on the cross tells us that he is our covering. And while he was there on a the cross, he, he said this in John 19, 26. He says, or it says, when Jesus therefore saw his mother. And of course, you know, only John wrote this. For the disciple on whom he loved standing by. He said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. There wasn't another disciple at the cross there alongside Mary that day. But if you show up to the cross, you inherit a spiritual family. How many of you know that we have a spiritual family? One that you never dreamed of. He made us a family. I'm closer to many of you than I am my own natural brothers and sisters. You've become my family. I see you more often. We gather every Sunday. I don't get to gather with my family every Sunday. You come up and you encourage me and you pray for me and you hug on me and that's, that's family. That's good. That's the only thing that we have in the shadow of the cross, isn't it? We all have that in common. See, the cross is something we can all have in common. And when we get in that shadow of the cross, it doesn't matter that we don't have the same last name. We have his name. We don't all have to have the same skin color. We are of the same nation, the same kingdom. We don't have to have the same education. We just have to know who our Savior is. We don't have to come from the same economics of this world, for we have the kingdom of God, and he provides for us. And we don't have to come from the same part of town. All we have to do is just be one true body of Christ. And it doesn't matter if you believe in speaking in tongues or you don't believe in speaking in tongues, or you, you believe in sprinkling uh, in baptism or full submersion. It doesn't matter uh, if you have altar calls at your service or you don't have altar calls, if you're liturgical or you're evangelical, it doesn't matter. Are we at the foot of the cross? Do we believe in one Lord? Do we believe in Jesus? Just stand in the shadow of the cross. Are you at the foot of the cross? I invite you to the foot of the cross. It's our covering. The third statement is to remind us that he is our sacrifice. He took on what we couldn't do. In Matthew 27, 46, it says, In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A sacrifice. That was probably the most painful moment. Beyond the nails in his hands and in his feet, the separation from God, knowing that his father was separated from him, to cry out, why have you forsaken me? The fourth statement reminds us that he, he suffered. John 19, 28 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. Not only in the sacrifice and not only in the suffering, he thirsted. He also taught things like that his food was to do the will of his father and he taught others about living water and if they were to have that living water, they would never thirst again. 
but yet the one who offered living water to never thirst again on that cross, taking our sin and shame, taking on our burdens, taking on everything that kept us from God. In that separation, the one who gave living water now says, I thirst. For that moment, he had been cut off from that living water. He had already been slapped. He had already been spit on. He had already been humiliated. He had already been stripped naked. He had already been mocked. He had already been scourged, abandoned, given a scepter and a crown of thorns, forced to carry his cross to his own execution. He had been betrayed, not just by one disciple, but another one denied even knowing him. And I suppose... That betrayal from a brother can hurt 30 times more than nails or a slap. Because we've all felt that pain. Jesus didn't come to run a successful ministry or be famous. He did come for the loss and he did come that we might have life and life more abundantly. But it seems in his ministry he ran off more than he had following him. He didn't come from wealth. He said foxes have holds and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He came with one purpose, and that was to die for our unrighteousness. The fifth statement shows that he is our provision. John 19.30 says, So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. It is finished. Now you know I like to get into the Greek and I'm not going to do that this morning. But that word in the Greek, finished, it actually means paid in full. You see, In that culture, when somebody had an accusation, they would be put in prison and they would have a debt. And until somebody came and paid that debt or until they had served the proper time, that debt had not been paid. Once that debt had either been paid monetarily or they had served their time, they received a paper that said, paid in full. And it's the exact same word that Jesus used on the cross when he said it is finished. In other words, we had a debt. Not only did he finish his mission, not only did he know that he had finally come to the point where he completed everything that he was sent to do, it was finished for you and I. The wages that we had, the debt that we had on us, paid in full. It's done. We don't have to be bound by that anymore. We have been freed. He came to set the captives free. I don't know about you, but it's a pretty good feeling if you've ever been in a restaurant or in a drive through and somebody pays ahead of you or somebody pays your bill. It's a good feeling. The teens have said it. When you've paid for someone to go to teen camp and there was no way they could go and they find out somebody sponsored them and they hear the news, Your camp's paid in full. And the rejoicing that they have knowing that somebody cared enough about them to do something that they couldn't do. Or maybe their guardian or their folks did not have the ability to pay their way, but somehow God provided. And just, it's a good feeling. But how much more is it that we know that God provided and made a way for us that we had no way? We had a separation from Him. And you know, I couldn't go through a day like today without sharing that gift of God because God is our provision. Jesus is our provision from the Father. And John 3, 16, 17 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but paid in full. We can have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. 
That is the goal. Our salvation. That's God's love for us. That's God's provision for us. You want to know what God's plan for your life is? The very first step is, the first plan he has for you is that you will be reconciled to him, that you will find life through his son, Jesus Christ, that this sacrifice is all that you need. You only need to receive it. You don't have to do anything else. Paid in full. (coughs) Number six. (coughs) Excuse me. He is our defense. Isn't that odd that we think of Jesus as our defense while he is on the cross? He's, our, he's on the cross, but he's our defense. I don't know about you, but I still need him to be my defender now and then. Hmm. We, we, we've heard the stories and we've heard the teachings that Jesus did not hang on a cross alone. We often see in pictures of Easter or on postcards or whatever, we see three crosses. And he had unrighteous Thieves crucified alongside him. That's why I said the cross in itself is not... We we use it as a holy emblem, but the cross in itself, by itself, is not holy. For these thieves died on a cross. And he was even mocked and ridiculed by those thieves initially, but something clicked with one of them. And he acknowledged Jesus. And he rebuked one thief, rebuked the other thief, and said, hey, we deserve what we're getting. He's innocent. And he called out to Jesus in that moment. And this is what Jesus said, because Jesus had recognized that that thief acknowledged who he was. And in Luke 23, 43, Jesus said to that thief, assuredly, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, I know that will mess with some of your theology because Jesus said, today you'll be with me. And people who think that maybe you can't be born again unless you've been water baptized are going to have a real hard time with this verse. Might have a real hard time with a man who had been a thief hanging on a cross, being executed for his sins by man, getting what he deserved in the eyes of man, turns to Jesus, acknowledges Jesus, and Jesus gives him permission for his soul to go into paradise. He never went to synagogue that we know of. It doesn't say that he ever went to seminary. It doesn't say he ever went to a Bible study. It doesn't say anything about this thief other than he acknowledged Jesus. That is really good news for you and I. And Jesus talks, had taught about a rich man and a poor man. And the poor man he called Lazarus. And as he told this story, he said that the rich man had been abusive and had actually, they both died, Lazarus and this rich man. And the rich man went down into Hades. And Lazarus went into what Jesus called the Abraham's bosom, which really means the side of Abraham. It's, it's where, according to really what Jesus was saying, it was where the saints had gone to be and to wait and to go and to wait on him. And here... Perhaps this place that Jesus told us about, which he just referred to as Abraham's bosom. Maybe you had Noah. Maybe, obviously, Abraham was there, which I guess so would Isaac and Jacob. And maybe Joseph and Moses and David and Daniel, Rachel, Rebecca, Rahab, the prophets who had prophesied about the coming Messiah. Perhaps they were all in this place. But the writer of Hebrews gives us a little bit of insight when we see in chapter 11 there is a a chapter that we call the Hall of Faith where 
this writer begins to share with us all of those who had believed and all of those who had hoped and all of those who had wait were waiting to see the promise. How I many you know Jesus was the promise? They had waited on that promise. And this is what it says in Hebrews eleven thirteen. After it lists all these heroes of faith, it says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. In other words, they saw afar off. There was one coming. There was a promise coming. He would someday arrive. Having seen them afar off, we're assured of them. They knew. They knew that Jesus would come. Maybe they didn't know that he would be called Jesus. They just knew the Messiah. And then we look down that chapter, and it ends with this saying, around 39 and 40, and it says, After all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, all of these people had obtained a good testimony, testimony they had done great things they had they had prophesied they had done mighty works calling fire from heaven uh, building an ark where there shouldn't have been an ark uh, splitting the red sea watching lions mouths be closed watching friends be saved from fiery furnaces they had seen all of these things and had a good testimony through faith from those things it says, but they did not receive the promise. They had all died before Jesus came. But it said, God having provided something better for us. Do you get that? We're this side of the Messiah. That they should not be made perfect apart from us. Do you hear that? They had not yet been complete. They had been in a place of waiting because Jesus had not yet come. Isn't it amazing that Jesus changed everything? Even those who God had before. Somehow God has given us a salvation for those behind us, those today, and those ahead of us. And here, Jesus tells the thief, today you're going to be, me, be with me in paradise. I can imagine as they broke the legs of the thieves and the thieves perished while Jesus was there. The thief walks in to the room. He walks into Abraham's bosom. And he looks around at people maybe he had never been taught of before. Maybe he didn't know their names. But he walks into this place that Jesus called paradise. Paradise. And he's getting to meet people like Moses and Daniel and Isaiah, Ezekiel. And I can imagine he's walking among those that we might consider mighty. And, and suddenly they hear something in the distance. Something that they had waited for. Something that they had only seen afar off before. In Daniel hearing and beginning to see that something might be happening. He remembers what he saw, and he remembers what he wrote, and he remembers that he wrote, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he starts to get excited. And he said, could it be him? Who is this coming? And David, having written the Psalms about the coming Messiah, maybe he began to start getting his harp together and starting to sing the Psalms of the one who might be coming, singing, who is this King of glory? The Lord, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. And I'm sure in my imagination, the Bible doesn't say this. This is Pastor Ray's imagination that we're in right now. I can imagine David 
playing his harp, saying, Who is this king of glory? Could it be him? Who is this king of glory? And the thief goes, I know him. You know him? What, were, were you a prophet sent by God? Might Isaiah and Jeremiah say. Or did you do mighty acts? Gideon or Samson might say. Did you teach the Torah in the temple? Others might ask. No, none of that. Then what was your basis for coming here? Who are you? I'm just a thief. I met him, and one day, within an hour, he, how did you get in here? He said I could come. He said I could come. Today. Today, it doesn't matter if you've been with the Lord for 50 years. Or in five minutes from now, you're going to give your heart to him. The beautiful thing is, it doesn't matter. Maybe you feel that you're worse than a thief. Jesus said, you can come with him. Jesus, see, there is a promise that we're in right now. The others waited on. And they won't be complete without us. Isn't that beautiful? Why? Because he's our defense. He was a defense for a thief. He was the one who said, you're going to be with me. Yeah, that'll mess with your theology. Finally, Jesus is the finisher. Ladies, if you have husbands, you've probably heard all the stories of I'll finish the garage. I'll finish the basement. And you wait and you wait. Projects that start never finish. Jesus is a finisher. Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus cried out in a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathes his last. It is finished. It is paid in full. See, Jesus died in manly body, but his spirit went to work. Jesus went to work. He didn't just rest in a tomb for three days. He went, and it says that he obtained the keys of Hades and death. See, the devil thought he had won. But could you imagine, we just imagine a Abraham's bosom. I can imagine the party that might have been going on in hell and all of a sudden Jesus walks in. Give me the keys. Hand them over. They don't belong to you anymore. You see, because the first Adam gave away his authority. He forfeited his authority. But Jesus, the last Adam, was our reset Revelations. Let's go to Revelation with me for just a minute. Revelation 1, verse 17 and 18. John said this. John had this revelation. He saw heaven. And he said, when I saw him, when he saw Jesus, he said, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, but behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and death. He finished. He may have finished his task, but he may not be finished with you. Today, if you feel that you're not complete, I'm telling you, there's a finisher that you can put your faith in. 
Even if you don't feel that you have the strength to do it yourself, there is one that we can call on. He is our Savior. He is the one who said it is finished. And He can complete you. And He can make something much better out of you than we can make out of ourselves. I don't know about you. I've tried to do it on my own. I couldn't do it. I needed Jesus. He did it. He saw it through for us. And he also said that he would not only return again from the grave, he also said he would return again to come for us. That's good stuff. And until we're instructed, until then we've been instructed, get ready for communion, that we would remember him, we'd remember his death until he comes back again. Amen? That would remember him. When he sat at that last supper with his disciples, he gave them a cup and he said, drink all of it. And what most of us don't know, or maybe we've heard it at a Seder meal, in the custom uh, of the time, in the culture of the time, a, a groom, when he would meet his soon-to-be bride, there was certain traditions and certain ceremonies that were done. And one that would be that a groom would give his soon-to-be bride a cup. And if she drank from it, she was accepting him as the groom. If she refused to drink, she couldn't be his bride. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, Take, just drink it, man. Drink all of it. Don't, don't, don't just sip this up. I love you. I want, I want you to accept me. I want this relationship to be so close and intimate. Today, as we take this communion, let's receive this acceptance. Let's receive him, even if you received him before. He's good. The night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. After giving thanks, he took it and he broke it. Knowing what was to come. Knowing this was his last supper. His last time with them. Maybe it didn't make sense to them. But what he said was, he said, this is my body broken for you. It hadn't been broken yet. But he knew he was going to finish. He knew it was going to happen. He knew that he was going to give his life willingly to be the perfect sacrifice for us. He gave thanks. He broke it. Wow, that's dedication. Likewise, in the same manner, he had this cup. cup, the new and everlasting covenant, represents the blood, the blood that was shed for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. And yes, as long as we take of this bread and we drink of this cup, we'll remember the Lord's death, not just on Good Friday, every day, and until he returns. Heavenly Father, thank you. I don't know if we can say it enough. I don't know if we can say it the right way. We don't have any words. All we can say is thank you. Thank you for this broken body. Thank you for this shed blood that covers a multitude of sins. Each one of us might feel like in ourselves we have a multitude of sins. But it covers. Just like one of the statements we heard at the cross, it covers. We get to be covered. All we have to do is say yes. Thank you, Lord, for this indescribable gift. We receive it today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can come up and grab one of these. It's a little different than we normally do. Hold on to them. We're going to take them together. This communion, we'll take it together at the end.
Sister Teresa, thank you so much for leading us in worship today. You're a blessing. God is so good. <clears throat> God is good. God is good. I heard you in all the time. Okay. Lord, thank you so much for your sacrifice. You can wash away our sins. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ. The blood of the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Father, I thank you for this family, this spiritual family, Lord, that even though we may not all look alike or dress alike or have the same backgrounds, Lord, we're, we're one and the same in one spirit under your name. We thank you that you've given us your name, the only name we need. The only name that needs to be called on. I just pray, Lord, that today, Father, hearts are stirred, spirits are stirred. To not just give a religious response on this Good Friday, but to give a heartfelt response to follow you wholeheartedly. 
to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind. Because you gave it all for us. Lord, we give it all to you. We don't have anything to give you, but we we give you our lives and we give you our heart. And we thank you. You paid a debt you didn't know. We owed a debt we could not pay. So Lord, I just bless this family, this family of faith, each one that's represented here, every household. Lord, I pray that your peace would rest on them, that your presence would be with them. They would feel your love like they've never felt it before, that this would be a year of incredible spiritual growth, to go to new depths together, that your presence would be with us, because there's more than just two or three gathered, but you promised to be in our midst. We thank you. We welcome you, not just into this sanctuary, but Lord, into our homes, into our lives, into our hearts. And I pray this blessing over each one that has came out today. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the everlasting, unconditional love of God the Father, communion, guidance, power, of the Holy Spirit. May it all be with you now and until we shall meet again. And all of God's grateful people say, amen. God bless you.